Good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be with you today. Uh, let me say a few words to introduce this uh, seminar that tries to uh, link the, uh, uh, what's happening at the global level as the, uh, our friends at the IMF uh, are seeing it and uh, as they, uh, every year and every six months actually, they prepare their world economic outlook. Uh, and I would like to thank the IMF team. And we have uh, uh, three members, if four members of the team. Uh, um, Roberto Caldarelli, who looks, uh, looks after Morocco. Uh, thank you for joining us. And Talin Koroncelian is the deputy director of uh, the Middle East MCD department. And we also have uh, Mrs. Berkman, who is division chief. Uh, at MCD as well, um, and Mr. Nabar, who works in the World Economic Study Division, <coughs> heads it actually. So thank you all for being here, and the other friends from and colleagues from the Policy Center that you, you can see in the agenda. Um, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, colleagues at the IMF, particularly because uh, in this time of uncertainty, what is important is to exchange, discuss, dialogue, confront ideas, uh, diverge, uh, agree, disagree, etc. It is the process, it is the path that is important, rather, I would say, than uh, where, where what we see are, are specific views, uh, and particularly in economics, as we know, things are so complex and volatile those days that it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to make a, you know, a forecast. Uh, and actually, we don't do policies on forecasts. Uh, uh, governments do policies on uh, political dimensions, and also they try to respond to the demand of their population. We, all, we often tend to forget that, that in the end, the ultimate goal of public policy is the well-being of a population. So uh, in this very difficult time, the demand from for, uh, from populations to their government, to their states, are very high. There's a very uh, you know, strong demand for protection, for provision of safety nets, for provision of health services, etc. So I think it's important to keep this in mind. Uh, you will tell us more about the outlook and uh, uh, how uh, it plays out in different regions and what it means for Morocco. I think it's important. It is the environment in which Moroccan economy will evolve. As you know, the Moroccan economy is, uh, is an open economy. It's very uh, depends on the rest of the world for its uh, domestic uh, growth in terms of uh, remittances, tourism sector, exports, imports. It's a well integrated economy to, uh, to particularly Europe, but more generally, more and more with Africa and the rest of, uh, of the world. Uh, what I would say in introduction is really, and I will let you speak. Uh, talk about the, uh, the outlook and how you see it linking to Morocco. But I think let us not forget that the crisis has not erased deep and structural challenges that are still there. Uh, I think uh, there is a short term macroeconomic management of a crisis, uh, you know, expansion in fiscal uh, expenditure, social safety net, but also the role of monetary policy, etc. Uh, and Roberto, you will tell us about more about uh, how, how you see uh, these macroeconomic policies for Morocco. But there are deep structural uh, uh, challenges. And I think for Morocco and the rest of the world, actually, is climate. We need to keep our focus on climate. It is of utmost importance for the future of the world. Uh, it's a very serious issue. Uh, that we have not always been tackling with the degree of seriousness that is needed around the world. We still produce too, many, too much energy on, base, on the basis of coal. This is just one example among others. So other uh, challenges are, of course, uh, providing efficient social safety net and investing in the capacity of individuals in training and education for the 21st century. Uh, this is not a short-term issue. This is generational reforms, it takes 25 years to change uh, the stock, uh, I would say, if I may, of uh, your labor force to improve its skills and its quality. So I think these structural reforms 
uh, we should keep an eye on them and we should continue to uh, to invest in those uh, in those reforms as you are aware morocco for instance uh, under the leadership of the king has announced that there will be a full coverage over medium term in terms of social safety net for the population uh, it is uh, responding to this uh, more volatile world this also an equity dimension and fairness dimension in society and i think this is the third structural issues that is there let us not forget that inequality has increased in many regions of the world that there are demands from population particularly in advanced economies but it will play out on us for more equality for more fairness for a you know more equal distribution of uh, uh, of income and that creates pressure on state that needs to respond uh, to to this need again this is a structural issue that needs uh, important reform reforms to be uh, to be corrected and uh, uh, it's not uh, just a short term management of fiscal and monetary policy that will uh, that uh, will correct uh, will correct that and of course health so um, and uh, social safety net and health, climate, uh, education are those structural reforms that I see as being uh, uh, highlighted in the world economic outlook as well uh, in different ways, but that are uh, sort of under, uh, but still very much there. And they are the ones that will reforms that are needed to prepare the future while we need to navigate through uh, the, the short-term fiscal monetary exchange rate uh, policies and risks that are around. Uh, I forgot one, which is the last one, and I will close on that, which is debt. The, the WIO in, insists on debt. Uh, it, we can have a discussion. Uh, there are still very important issues about how do we account debt, unfortunately, around the world. Uh, it remains an important issue, the quality of statistics. Um, I think I would add one, which is the financial financial risks and, in general, financial conditions that are important for a country like Morocco and Africa in general. Uh, the outlook for interest rate and inflation in the U.S. will have an important role on interest rates uh, and the, monitor, the, the, the financial condition for in, and debt. For, for raising debt on global markets by Morocco and Africa is an important one. We've seen some great news from some countries that have been coming back on the, the last week uh, on the global debt market. But I think at some point we will need to uh, sort it out, I would say, uh, the, this debt overhang, which is not specific to, uh, to, uh, to Africa, but it's uh, in general and also in uh, advanced economies with a last point. Uh, if I keep going, going on, I will have a long list. But the last point is demographics. I think demographics plays an important role when you look at that. Uh, it's, never, it's fundamentally an intergenerational issue. Uh, and uh, Morocco has specific demographics. We're sort of uh, in the middle, in a way, between Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and, uh, and the advanced economies of Europe uh, with the population growth rate that is around 1.1%. Uh, so this is something that has been needs to be taken into account when you look at education, health, and sustainability of, fin of public finances, and as well as that. So again, many thanks uh, to uh, to the to the IMF team, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. And uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Al Ainawi, and thank you also for uh, hosting us to this in this webinar. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, everyone. Our uh, discussion today comes at a real turning point. It's uh, we are a year after an unprecedented maybe crisis that has taken a toll on human lives and livelihoods and this in all countries around the world and if we look at the middle east and north africa region our region has also been affected by a severe drop in oil prices for oil exporting countries and a drought in other countries like in morocco for instance now 
as you mentioned, thankfully, countries have responded strongly and used all their tools to contain the spread of the virus and to provide maybe lifelines to their populations. But nonetheless, if we look at the global economy, it contracted by 3.3% and the MENA region by 3.4%. And as my colleague will be mentioned, without this support, the contraction would have been three times as large. Now we are entering the second year of the crisis. And of course, uncertainty remains high and very high, but maybe our focus is shifting from managing the crisis to exiting the crisis, supporting a strong recovery, and transitioning to a more sustainable and equitable growth model. And uh, you, as you will hear maybe from my colleagues, uh, the path to the recovery will be uneven and divergent, both across and within countries. And to a large extent, this will be related to the vaccination of the population, and therefore, our first message is that the vaccine rollout is an urgent must in all countries. And for that, global and regional cooperation will be critical. But also, I mean, our second message is that countries will need to solidify and strengthen the recovery, as we will know, because I mean, there will be a lot of long term scaring and this uh, strengthening the recovery will help to reduce maybe this long term scaring. And for and this, I mean, will require maintaining the targeted support to people and sectors that are mostly affected and continue to be affected until the recovery is well entrenched. As you said, I mean, not all countries will have the means and that is going to be an issue. And particularly after the last year's support, there will be countries will face challenges. And for those countries, of course, there will be a need to balance the support to the economy with preserving that sustainability. But these countries will also need the support from the international community to firm up the recovery. And our third message is that this is the year to start building a new economic model that is not only resilient, but also agile to adapt uh, to future trends. As you mentioned, I mean, the structural challenges and promoting higher and inclusive growth has been a priority for the MENA region over the last decade. But this crisis made this agenda even more urgent because it exacerbated the pandemic challenges. If we, for instance, if we take youth unemployment, I mean, it reached 32% in Morocco and 55% in Jordan. And while this agenda remains key, the pandemic raised the criticality of some reforms, as you mentioned. And maybe three priorities from my perspective is, first is that we really need to recognize that a strong and well-targeted social fabric will be critical, both for the recovery, as well as to build a better future. And by social fabric, I mean safety net, but also health and education. Second, promoting good governance also should be at the center of any new economic model. And this will not only help maybe uh, spur reforms in large public sectors, but more importantly, it will strengthen people's confidence in their policymakers. And this is very important as we move uh, forward. And third, we need to invest in sectors that will thrive in the future, including technology and green investment. And here, I think there is a lesson from the pandemic and we need to capitalize on the lessons that we learned from the pandemic, how we use the digital platforms and technology to provide uh, support to vulnerable people, uh, to provide uh, medical uh, services or distance learning. And capitalizing on this will help countries to prepare for the post-pandemic era. Maybe let me conclude maybe with one thought. If we think about transformations, they encompass growth enhancing structural changes 
And transformations may come from policies, but they can also come from global trends like globalization or major shock. The COVID-19 pandemic is another of these transformative events, and it provides an opportunity for many countries to transform their economies and their institutions to be more equitable, more inclusive, more resilient and greener. Maybe let me stop here and I very much look forward to today's debate. Thank you. for these uh, policy relevant messages that lay the ground for the discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm Abdel Aziz Ali, head of the research economic department here at the Policy Center for the New South, and I'm very pleased to be your moderator. So please allow me to introduce our distinguished panelists. So we are welcoming Mr. Malhar Nabar, who heads the World Economic Studies Division in the IMF Research Department, which produces the World Economic Outlook. Mr. Nabar's research interests are in financial development, investment, and productivity growth. We also welcome uh, Mrs. Pelin Berkman, who heads the Regional Analytics and Strategy Division in the IMS Middle East and Central Asia Department, which produced also the Regional Economic Outlook. Her field of expertise covers monetary policy, international finance, macroeconomics, and development. We have also Mr. Ottaviano Canuto, who is a senior fellow at the Policy Center for the New South, principal at the Center for Macroeconomics and Development, and non-resident fellow at Brookings Institute. And last but not least, Mr. Roberto Cardelli, who serves as assistant director in the Middle East and Central Asia Department of the IMF and mission chief for Morocco. Uh, so today's discussions will tackle the global, the MENA, and the Moroccan economic outlook. We are one year into this crisis, and every time we believe we are out of the woods, we realize how much uncertainty is surrounding us. For some country, uh, for some economies, I would say, the worst is probably behind them. But for others, there is still no end in sight. The road to the pre-pandemic lifestyle depends certainly on the vaccination rollout across every country in every nation. Still, the virus mutation can undermine the tremendous scientific advances and bring the global economy back on its knees. Nationalism, divergence, multidimensional inequality, scares on the supply capacity, financial stability are all rising issues that require, I would say, comprehensive approach at the national, but also at the global level. So before giving the floor to our panelists, I remind, I remind our audience that we will have a little more than 60 minutes discussion that I expect very fruitful, followed by around 15 minutes Q&A session. So don't hesitate along the webinar to share your questions via YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Simultaneous interpretation in French is also available. So without any further ado, I invite Mr. Malhar Nabar to share the findings of the VO Chapter 1 on the global conjecture. So Mr. Nabar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm just going to share a few slides here to set the stage. So. As you know, we just recently released our World Economic Outlook, uh, the April edition. And uh, what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is, is give you a brief overview of the, the main messages from the, from the report. So I'm sure you've seen by now that we have actually raised our growth forecast for this year. So there is an improved outlook um, and that relates to three factors. First of all, the rollout of vaccines, which gives us hope that uh, there is a way out of this health crisis and the economic crisis that accompanies it. Secondly, we've also seen additional policy support uh, relative to uh, January when we, we released our last forecast, especially in the United States, uh, but also in other countries. And that, that uh, helps improve the outlook as well. And we continue to be surprised on the upside by the adaptation to, to subdued mobility uh, as I'll show you in a second, relative to what we forecast, we see for most economies uh, improved growth outturns in, in the fourth quarter of last year. And that, of course, puts us in a better place for, for, for this year. Uh, in terms of the medium term outlook, uh, we expect at this point, conditional on this pandemic ending by the end of 2022, and that we do not have any 
systemic financial uh, stress, that the COVID-19 recessions will, will leave smaller persistent damage, smaller scars than the GFC did. Uh, but there is a reversal of patterns. Last time around, uh, we saw that the advanced economy suffered larger medium-term losses. Uh, this time around, we expect, based on what we know at this point, that the emerging markets will suffer larger medium-term losses compared to the advanced economies. And this relates to one of the major themes that, uh, that we have in the WIO, which is of uh, divergences. We're seeing divergences across countries related to access to vaccines and therapies, related to the, the, the size and the effectiveness of policy support, and to the structural characteristics of economies, but also we're seeing divergences within countries across sectors with manufacturing doing well, services still subdued, and um, divergences at, across demographic groups with uh, women, lower educational attainment workers, and the youth uh, doing relatively worse than, uh, than comparator groups. In terms of policy messages, some of these were already previewed in the comments that preceded uh, this, this presentation. Essentially, we call for a tailored approach to tailor the, the policies to the stage of the pandemic and the strength of the recovery. Um, there's a strong component for international and multilateral cooperation. Some countries are better placed than others to, to support their lives and livelihoods and to get their economies back on parts of recovery. But policy space is, is severely constrained in many countries, especially among the low-income countries. And here, international support will be extremely vital to, to ensure that these countries too get back on the path of recovery. I'll expand on these to the, towards the end of my presentation. Now, in terms of the starting point, what we saw at the end of last year, and also we continue to see with the high frequency indicators that we have for the first quarter of this year, is that the rebound has been stronger than what we had forecast, despite uh, worsening news on the pandemic front. This chart here summarizes some of the, the main economies that uh, for which we have the quarterly data. And what you can see is pretty much across the board, there's been a positive surprise at the end of last year. The, the, bar, the, the component of the bars in yellow um, show you that pretty much across the board, most countries that we followed had registered positive surprises relative to what we had forecast. And this comes on top of a positive surprise that we also registered in the preceding quarter, the third quarter of 2020. Um, relative to what we had forecast. And as a result, that leaves us in a slightly better place for 2021 and, and, um, and, and, and helps ensure that, that this, this recovery that we're seeing uh, resumes in, in this first quarter as well. Now, as I said, this is very much a story of manufacturing uh, led rebound at this point. The chart on the left shows you that industrial production, manufacturing recovered a lot stronger from the trough uh, of the middle of last year compared to services. We have seen, this is good news here, that, that services, the, the outlook for services has also improved recently. The, the line in green shows you the uptick in the most recent observations. But of course, there's a lot of uncertainty as long as we have the virus with us, uh, that, that the possibility of renewed lockdowns would of course mean that contact intensive activity is, is, is set back again. The chart on the right shows you that the, the, the improved outlook for manufacturing has been accompanied by a strong rebound in merchandise trade Initially, at the, in the middle of last year, it was mostly consumer goods in advanced economies and capital goods in, in, in emerging market economies uh, that we saw strong improvements in impo imports of those products. But increasingly, we're seeing the import recovery has broadened and now encompasses different various different categories of goods. Uh, of course, services, cross-border services continue to be subdued. This improvement has been accompanied by a firming of commodity prices, which is, of course, uh, an important uh, determinant of the outlook for uh, the Middle East and Central Asia region. And this is this is seen not just in, in, in oil, but also in metals related to, in particular, the strong recovery in China, um, but increasingly also in food, though, although in food, we're seeing that there are some supply side issues, uh, food, food scarcity in some parts are also driving up food prices. A lot of attention has been paid to what's going on in financial markets recently. And so far, at least, despite the volatility that we've seen over the last month or two, in general, financial markets continue to be supportive. And that's, of course, good news for the recovery going forward. However, we're not out of the woods, and there's still a lot of work to be done to repair the damage. Uh, the charts here show you the slack that we have, that we project in the advanced economy group on the left and the emerging market economy group on the right. For most countries, you see that, that that we have negative output gaps out into 2022, 23, 
particularly for the advanced, for the emerging market economies. For some, notably the United States now with the additional policy support, we are actually seeing output gaps closing and, and, and output project to the above potential uh, by next year. A corollary of this, of course, is that there's still a lot of healing that needs to take place in the labor market. This was a catastrophic hit to, to labor market outcomes last year, particularly to those who worked in contact intensive sectors. And employment levels, both in advanced economies and in emerging market economies, remain uh, below pre-pandemic, below the levels that we saw last February. Uh, so there's still a lot of slack in the labor markets. And associated with this, we've also seen lower labor force participation relative to pre-pandemic levels. Some people have had to leave the workforce to take after kids, look after kids who are home from school, elderly dependents who are home from, from assisted living facilities, um, and labor force participation rates are still below pre-pandemic levels. Finally, just to round out the, the picture on Slack, another way to see this is that inflation pressures remain muted for uh, virtually all advanced economies at this point and for most emerging market and developing economies. Although now we are seeing some exceptions um, where inflation has picked up. Uh, inflation has been much in the news recently, especially in, in the United States, concerns about inflation pressures associated with uh, the, the large policy support that's, that's, that's been put in place and is expected further down the road. But at this point, we don't see any signs of that. Inflation expectations continue to remain well anchored and as I said, with the, the large slack that we have in labor markets, there's still a long exit ramp before we expect inflation pressures to, to, to really take off. Let me just very briefly turn to the, the story of divergent recoveries and the outlook that we have uh, for the global economy. A lot of the divergence, of course, relates to the expected uh, rollout of vaccines and the access to vaccines. The chart on the left shows you that advanced economies have been able to secure a large share of the doses that, 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 that are available at this point. Um, and most advanced economies expect to be able to vaccinate um, the bulk of their populations uh, by the end of this year. In some, it'll probably be by the summer. However, the picture is not as uh, promising for emerging markets and especially for low income developing countries where most of them rely on the COVAX facility uh, to secure their vaccines and, and, and even at this stage COVAX is not fully funded. And this of course has a big bearing on the divergent recovery speeds that we expect across advanced economies and low income developing countries. A, a related factor is the extent of policy support. The chart on the right shows you that, that advanced economies um, delivered substantial policy support last year uh, on, on, on the fiscal front and also not shown in this chart, but also on the monetary front. Uh, and, and we expect that that some of that, although it will roll off this year with the, with the improved outlook, some of that will continue. However, for advanced, for emerging market developing economies, the space is more constrained and support as a result was commensurately less. Just very quickly on the numbers, as I mentioned, we have raised our forecast for 2021. A lot of that has to do with the countries that are shown on this slide, which is the advanced economy group, uh, especially the United States on the back of, of substantial policy support, but also in other, other advanced economies where we saw activity uh, come back stronger than we had expected after lockdowns were eased. And even with the renewed restrictions that were placed, for example, in the Euro area uh, at the end of last year and into the first quarter of this year, um, activity, especially on the manufacturing side, continued to surprise us on the upside, suggesting that, that there has been some adaptation over time to, to subdued mobility. We've also raised our forecast for the emerging market and developing economy groups and, and uh, for, the, for the EMDE group, and, and Pelin will go into more detail on, on the prospects for, for the Middle East and Central Asia region, and Roberto and Morocco. But this is a global snapshot. Uh, EMs are also expected to do better than we'd expected related to the, the, the in particular to the, the improved prospects for India and China. India, of course, much in the news right now is the epicenter of the pandemic, but, but even here, there's this disconnect with worsening news on the pandemic front, but on the economic activity front, um, the high frequency indicators suggest adaptation and improved outcomes relative to what we expected. Although the growth figure for India looks very high, 12 or 12 and a half percent, it's important to look at it in the context of the negative 8% contraction that happened last year. And even by the end of next year, most of these countries will be well below the levels that we had projected pre-pandemic uh, for their economies. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty around this outlook. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe just focus on three on the upside. 
The first, of course, is if we see improved outcomes in terms of vaccine production and distribution, this will allow uh, services activity to normalize faster, cross-border travel to normalize faster. If policy support proves to be a more effective bridge to this, this period of vaccine-powered normalization than we're currently anticipating, or if there is even more policy support in the pipeline, that could, of course, uh, lead to better growth outcomes than we have in our baseline. And we're also seeing, there was mention of the structural changes that are taking place. We're also seeing this accelerated shift to e-commerce and digitalization. And if that uh, encourages new growth clusters to emerge, uh, which, which boosts productivity growth, which as you know, has been very anemic going into the crisis, this could also lift confidence and, 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 and deliver a faster recovery than we're projecting. However, downside risks are significant and um, the, the, the flip side, of course, of the, the, the upside risk factor on vaccines is if things go worse than we're expecting, the logistical problems related to that risk and new virus mutants get ahead of this, get ahead of us, that could, of course, delay the pandemic and, and delay the, and protract the pandemic and delay the recovery. I want to just focus a, very briefly on financial conditions, which, as, as you know, uh, have been generally supportive, but um, recently we've seen a lot of volatility in markets related to uh, the the market shifting market expectations about the pace at which the Fed is expected to normalize policy, first to taper off asset purchases and then to actually lift the policy rate. And these divergent policy rate expectations, of course, have translated mm -hmm. into um, increases in, in core yields. Um, the chart on the right shows you the, the, the steep increase in the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield since the start of the year. But still at very low levels compared to historical averages, but, but there has been a very steep gradient. And that's translated into higher yields in other, other advanced economies and also in emerging market economies. If that persists, that could actually put vulnerable borrowers in a difficult spot and, and uh, hold back their recoveries going forward. The second point I want to make is on the medium term outlook, there's considerable uncertainty about the degree of persistent damage, the degree of scarring that we expect. One of the features of this pandemic, as you all know, is this uh, horrific um, hit to schooling, the lost instructional time, which out on the left shows you the, the average days of missed instruction with a much bigger impact on low income developing countries. And that, of course, will translate into subdued earnings prospects going forward unless strong remedial measures are put in place. Um, and it will translate into subdued productivity growth going forward due to slower human capital accumulation. The chart on the right shows you that compared to our pre-pandemic forecast, we expect very significant medium-term losses. Again, not as bad as we had expected that we saw at the time of the GFC, but still nevertheless considerable losses uh, across the different regions. And as I mentioned, the pattern is reversed relative to the previous global crisis. Here we are expecting a larger hit to emerging market and developing economies related to the more limited policy support and, and the, the, the more delayed vaccine rollout that we expect for them compared to advanced economies. Let me very briefly close with, uh, let me close with a very brief overview of our policy recommendations. This is necessarily broad brush because we cover 190 economies in the WIO. But um, as I mentioned, we are calling for tailored policies that are tailored to the stage of the pandemic to limit the damage uh, to, to uh, the hit to economic activity. In places where the pandemic is accelerating, clearly the priority is healthcare spending and continuing well-targeted policies to, to support uh, livelihoods. Where the pandemic seems to be behind, uh, behind us and where the recovery is, is durably underway, it's important to shift focus away from these lifelines to policies that support reallocation to put in place remedial measures for reversing the hit to human capital. Um, and looking further out ahead to the, the major, the, the, the structural challenges that, that we inherited from the previous crisis and entering this one and the legacies that this crisis is likely to leave behind, uh, it'll be important to, to, to boost productive, productive capacity to ensure that these gains are, uh, are equitably shared through stronger social safety nets and investments to help displaced workers uh, reallocate to, to, to the sectors that are likely to be growing faster coming out of the pandemic. Um, and all of this will need to be reinforced with a very strong multilateral effort, because as I mentioned, there are some countries for which they just don't have the luxury of, 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 of spending on all of these objectives. And, and here, international support, both in terms of vaccine delivery, but also in terms of ensuring uninterrupted access to international liquidity will be vitally important to ensure that they too gain, get, get on the path of durable recovery. Thank you.
<laughs> that says actually the scene for more tailored analysis for the region that is drawing actually a heavy economic and social legacy mm -hmm. along the last uh, decade. So for this, we go straight forward to Mrs. Berkman that would share the IMF's perspective on the region. Please, can you, can you un unmute yourself? Can you hear me now? Better? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Good afternoon, yes. good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me share my presentation uh, with you uh, very briefly. Here we go. All right, as you know, we published our regional economic outlook about a week ago. Uh, what I'll do with this presentation is uh, precisely as Malhar did for the global economy, I'm going to summarize our key messages, uh, which uh, is uh, zooming in uh, a little bit of the global messages that, that we see and heard uh, from Malhar uh, just now. Now, uh, a year after its emergence, uh, the, uh, the fight against COVID-19 pandemic continues. Infection rates, as shown by the yellow area on the first chart, have increased sharply during the pandemic's second wave, similar to what we observed in other emerging markets, as you see by the red line. After a moderation in early 2021, infection rates have started to rise again, and now the region is in the midst of a third wave. Meanwhile, on the positive side, the, uh, the vaccination campaigns have started, but with significant differences in coverage and the speed of the rollouts. So far, a few countries in the region are progressing with vaccine rollouts. On the positive side, the region hosts some of the global leaders, such as the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, uh, who have already vaccinated uh, sizable portions of their population. However, more broadly, uh, as you can see on the middle chart, Based on announced plans, the expected population coverage is une uneven across the region, and many countries rely solely on the COVAX facility. Um, and then, in terms of the what that how that translates into the uh, timing in terms of full vaccine coverage, we have pro broadly three sets of countries in the region, uh, as shown in the uh, third chart. Now, the early inoculators, such as the Gulf Cooperation Country uh, Council countries and Morocco. Uh, started vaccinations either in last December or in January, and most countries in this category are expected to inoculate a significant share of their population by the end of this year. Slow inoculators uh, started inoculations uh, with limited coverage uh, so far, uh, and they are not expected to inoculate a significant portion of their population until mid-2022. And we have a third set of countries, which uh, we call the late inoculators. Uh, they include the remaining countries, particularly low income countries in, in the region. This group is expected to start inoculations only in the second half of uh, 2021 20, and will likely experience pro prolonged vaccination rollouts. Nonetheless, there are emerging signs of regional cooperation to help this group. Uh, in the United Arab uh, Emirates, for example, the HOPE consortium is working on vaccine storage and the distribution in the region, while the uh, Vaccine Logistic Alliance is expected to support the delivery of 2 billion doses of vaccines this year under the COVAX facility. Now, similar to what we've seen in the global uh, picture, uh, activity bounced back better than expected in the second half of 2022, and the recovery has started in the region but it is still uneven among sectors and between countries. The real GDP growth estimates for the last year were revised up across the board, as shown by the blue bars in the first chart, relative to our projections in last October, uh, which you can see by the red uh, bars in that chart. Real GDP for MENA, uh, Middle East and North Africa, uh, for example, is estimated to have declined by 3.4%. Uh, uh, last year. Uh, this is an upward revision of about 1.6 percentage points relative to our projections in October 2020. Oil exporter uh, countries were particularly hit hard uh, with their re real GDP declining by about 4.5% uh, 
This is an upgrade about uh, two percentage points uh, relative to October, reflecting a strong policy response across, like, across the countries and also the substantial rebound in the second half of the year. Oil importing countries on average contracted by about 0.8%, uh, which is much milder, but this average hides a uh, significant variation across countries. Uh, secondly, we would like to note that remittances uh, held up better than expected. Uh, and this is shown in the, third, uh, the middle chart. After a short, uh, sharp contraction in the second quarter of 2020, they, reco uh, they recovered strongly in the third quarter. This reflected, we think, uh, third, uh, like a combination of factors. Uh, these include the recovery in remittance sending, uh, sending countries, uh, an accelerated switch to formal transfer channels due to border closures, and incentives for electronic transfers in some countries. Similarly, when we look at the corporate sector recovery, uh, this is ongoing, but at an uneven rate. The third chart shows corporate performance uh, during the crisis measured by the revenue growth. Blue markers show the initial impact uh, in the second quarter of last year, and yellow markers show the revenue growth in the third quarter. And the firm's initial conditions are cap captured by the average revenue growth in 2018 and 19 shown in the x-axis. There are four main takeaways uh, to take uh, from this chart. First, uh, small firms, the retail sector, contact intensive sectors, and the state-owned enterprises entered the crisis with weaker revenue growth than others, uh, other companies. Second, the initial impact of the crisis uh, in the second quarter uh, of last year was hardest for retail, energy, and manufacturing sectors and small firms. Third, uh, by the third quarter, uh, while revenues for manufacturing, non-contact intensive sectors and large companies uh, have recovered, small firms and contact intensive sectors continue to register negative revenue growth. And finally, while the state-owned enterprises had weaker initial conditions, as I mentioned earlier, they were not impacted as severely by the pandemic, their revenue growth, and this possibly reflects the state support that they received. Now, uh, looking ahead, uh, as Malhar emphasized at the global scale, the recovery paths are also divergent in our region. Uh, and that depends on the vaccine rollouts, the policy space and the policies, and the structural differences. Now, early access to vaccines uh, is expected to support near-term growth, particularly this year. Indeed, early inoculators uh, revised up their 2021 growth projections relative to the October Rio. By contrast, in other countries, vaccination is unlikely to be the main engine of growth, particularly this year. In addition, uh, countries that deployed above average fiscal support last year had a lower debt and therefore a faster recovery uh, like this year. And you can see that in the yellow dash line. And as a result, they're expected to return to pre-pandemic GDP levels earlier than the countries that provided below average support. Finally, uh, dependence on tourism is expected to put a drag on the recovery. Uh, the outlook for this set of countries will continue to be influenced by restrictions on domestic and international travel, as well as by social distancing measure measures. Hence, the growth projections of those countries that rely on tourism revenues were revised down relative to our October projections. Now, focusing on the low income and fragile states, uh, they will continue to face significant challenges. Um, these countries had a smaller response uh, to the crisis given their financing constraints. More worryingly, uh, many countries that are in need of spending for their development purposes, as indicated with a low SDG index in the vertical axis of the first chart, cut markedly their nominal expenditures compared to pre-pandemic projections as shown in the uh, x-axis. Now, these countries are also expected to face substantial vaccination costs. While the cost of vaccinating three quarters of the population is estimated, and this is a rough uh, estimation, uh, uh, to be under 1% of GDP for many countries in the region, the cost is expected to be much higher in, in percent of low-income countries' GDP, as shown by the blue bars in, in the middle chart. Finally, uh, low-income countries, in addition to these costs, will continue to face limited financing options, and this will continue to weigh uh, on their outlook. Uh, 
Now, overall, uh, the recovery is subdued uh, for the region and the uh, growth paths are diver divergent. Uh, and in addition to that, there is an exceptional uncertainty around our projections. Now, uh, projections for 2021 and 2022 vary across the region, as you'll, uh, you can see on the uh, left-hand side chart, but they remain below those of the EMD average, uh, shown in the dash green lines in the first chart. Growth in MENA, uh, Middle East and North uh, Africa, uh, is projected to pick up to 4% in 2021. This is an upgrade of 0.9 percentage points relative to our uh, October projections. This is mainly driven by oil exporting countries, uh, such as the Global Gulf Cooperation, but also by a large revision that we have uh, for Libya. Now, around this outlook, uh, there is exceptional uncertainty. In particular, uh, as Malhar mentioned, the race between vaccine rollouts and the new infections will determine whether the region will have a faster or more protracted recovery in the near term. Other risks to the outlook include uh, tighter financial conditions, and I will get back to that. Uh, Malhar already mentioned, but I'll focus on our region. And the premature withdrawal of policy support given the limited post, uh, uh, policy space in our uh, region. Furthermore, an unequal recovery could lead to an increase in poverty and a persistent widening of inequalities, which in turn could tri trigger social unrest. Now, turning to the medium term, uh, there are considerable out, uh, output losses in some uh, country groups. The chart on the left shows that on average, MENA region is expected to return to 2019 levels towards the end of this year. And then we exclude this large uh, revision in Libya. Uh, they're going to go back to uh, the, the 2019 level uh, to, in 2022. However, it will take considerable time for fragile and conflict affected states, as shown in the red line over here, before they go back to pre-pandemic GDP levels. In addition, uh, going forward, the economic activity levels are projected to remain below uh, pre-crisis trends, and that you can see between the difference between the dashed lines and the solid lines. Now, these average patterns uh, that I just mentioned for the region hide significant variation within the region. The second chart zooms in on 2024 GDP losses relative to our pre-pandemic projections. Uh, purple bars indicate global peers, and then the blue bars show the subgroups for our region. Uh, I'm going to mention uh, two takeaways from this chart. Uh, the first one is that while the output losses are less for MENA on average than for the other emerging markets and developing countries, this is mainly driven by oil exporters in the region. On average, GDP losses are less for oil, ex oil exporters, both in the region and elsewhere. Um, GDP losses for oil importing countries, uh, particularly oil importing uh, emerging markets, are larger, but they're also in line with what we see uh, broadly in line with what we see in the rest of the uh, emerging markets uh, elsewhere. Second, uh, the GDP losses are heavier for countries that rely on tourism, and you can see that on the last blue chart uh, on, on the right. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are some uh, risks around these outlook. I'll, I'll focus then like uh, the one aspect of it, which is the uh, title uh, global uh, conditions. Um, so tighter global financial conditions could elevate external vulnerabilities for a certain set of countries in our region. Uh, for example, in the recent increases in the US long-term uh, bond yields uh, that we see on the left chart, uh, we have seen some renewed capital outflows, uh, and that raised uh, concerns about the uh, like the access to finance for uh, the emerging markets. As Malhar mentioned, uh, when we look at the level of the long-term interest rates at global level, I mean it's correct that we have uh, still accommodative con conditions, but when we look at, for example, relative to the taper tantrum episode. Uh, the external debt in many countries in our region uh, and, uh, is higher, and the fiscal accounts are more stretched. Now, in this, country, uh, in this context, countries with weaker fundamentals, and in particularly external accounts, are more exposed to the risk. Now, we're showing this chart, but it is, it is important to note that although external debt now is higher, relative to, say, to uh, 2013, it also reflects, to some extent, higher official borrowing in many of these countries, reducing the risk of capital outflows. Uh, 
In addition, many of our countries have sufficient reserves, as you can see on the right, uh, uh, like the last uh, chart, and other assets, including uh, through the sovereign wealth funds, and this provides a buffer against sharp capital outflows. Now, the second aspect we would like to look at is the uh, high debt and the gross finance needs that we project for the region. Uh, this, together with the over-reliance on bank financing in, in many of the emerging markets, uh, in our emerging market countries in our region, uh, there is a, a, a risk of constraining policy action and risk of crowding out private sector credit when we need the most for the recovery. Now, average gross, uh, public gross financing needs in several countries uh, for the next two years, as shown with the blue bars in the first chart, are expected to remain elevated. Now, a key question is, if downside risks materialize, whether domestic banks will continue to be able to absorb the expected additional financing needs? To answer this question, we uh, perform two shock scenarios. First, to st uh, simulate a faster than expected tightening of global financial conditions. Yields are shocked by 200 basis points. This is similar to the observed impact during the 2013 uh, taper tantrum and also uh, other high volatility episodes. The impact is shown by the yellow bars on the left chart. And the delayed fiscal adjustment scenario uh, assumes that planned fiscal adjustment uh, for this year is postponed by one year due to a more prolonged recovery. The impact is shown by the purple bars. Now, the summary out of this is that under these scenarios, uh, average gross fi financing needs during 2021 and 2022 would increase by about 3% of GDP on average. And uh, this is about uh, half of the pandemic's impact on public gross financing needs in 2020. Now, such a scenario will require significant financing from domestic banks uh, in certain countries, as shown in the second chart. In particular, four governments in the region would absorb an additional 10 to 23% of their banking system assets. Such a development would further, further intensify sovereign bank linkages, reducing severely the liquidity available for private sector investment and likely weakening the prospects of a sustainable, strong recovery. Now, given the picture that I just painted, there is a multi-speed recovery uh, there are emerging vulnerabilities and exceptional uncertainty around the baseline uh, projections that we uh, showed, policies would need to balance between saving lives and livelihoods on the one hand and fostering recovery uh, and safeguarding the sustainability and financial stability on the other hand. While I'm not going to go into the details of this slide, I would like to emphasize maybe three points to supplement what uh, Talin uh, initially uh, uh, like uh, emphasized in her opening remarks. First, given that the recovery is protracted for many of our countries, many countries will need to continue to manage the crisis as with they did last year. In this context, saving lives and livelihoods is still a prior priority. This is highlighted in the upper uh, half of this, our policy circle. Global and regional cooperation would be particularly uh, critical to ensure adequate vaccine coverage for everyone. Second, given that many countries have already used their available fiscal space last year, policymakers would also need to find the right balance between the need to safeguard the debt sustainability and support the recovery. This is illustrated at the lower half of the policy circle. In this context, policy support should remain flexible, well-targeted, and in place until the recovery is entrenched. For countries with, without a fiscal space, any new targeted lifelines would need to be balanced with offsetting measures elsewhere. Fiscal adjustments should be anchored on a credible medium-term fiscal framework, as we have been emphasizing for some time, to reduce debt burdens, but at the same time to provide maximum support to the growth and recovery. Third, uh, policies should also safeguard the recovery as we uh, recover and emerge out of the crisis to ensure a transition to a new post-COVID economy. As economies open up, support policies should rotate toward ensuring a smooth reallocation of resources and limiting uh, the scarring, including through, for example, providing vocational train, uh, training and hiring incentives. The last but not the least, and uh, we have talked about this in our opening remarks as well, that policymakers will also need to lay the groundwork for a transformation 
towards an inclusive, resilient, and green economy. Now, this would mean addressing our, the long-standing issues, the structural issues uh, in the region. Uh, and we have been emphasizing these issues for a long time, uh, some time, uh, such as uh, in enhancing the governance and accountability, reforming the public sector and the state-owned enterprises, uh, enabling the private sector to create jobs, uh, reducing informality, which is quite high in the region, and tackling inequality and poverty. But as the crisis highlighted, countries should also leverage accelerating trends to deliver more efficient source, social safety nets. And there are examples in the region uh, that use uh, this opportunity to reach out to informal sectors and provide to most vulnerable uh, uh, sectors uh, and portions of the society. And the region could use this momentum to improve the social safety nets. Uh, at the same time, to invest in climate resilient and digital infrastructure. And I will highlight that uh, given the global context, there is an opportunity for the region to think about how the investment can take place, uh, not only to secure and adapt the climate change, uh, but also create jobs related to those investments, but also uh, use the accelerating trends su such as the use of digitalization and technology to a transformation to towards a more productive economy. I will stop here and really uh, looking forward to the debate. Very thankful to Ms. Uh, Penny Berkman for shedding light on different challenges facing the region and concluding with, with such a list of policy recommendations. I hope expected to increase the resilience of the economic system of the region and foremost to open new opportunities for its, for its youth, which aspires to a better and promising future. So now we turn to, to Mr. Ottaviano Canuto will share its own perspective on the current challenges facing the global economy, but also the regional economy. And uh, Mr. Otaviano, the floor is yours, yes. Thank you, Abed Aziz, and, and thank you all for having me here. This is, this is really great, and thanks uh, to the colleagues from the IMF. Uh, you know, as always, the World Economic Outlook provides us and the regional economic outlooks with uh, frameworks on how to understand not only the global economy, but how to approach this specific case. You have in both documents that we are discussing today, you have there which factors should one look at to understand the pace of recovery. You have there a framework to understand or look for where to find the scars of the crisis. One looks there to see uh, as well, which policies are, uh, let's say, proposed and appro as appropriate for that specific context. And you also have, uh, uh, let's say, a common uh, the reference to the common challenge that will be uh, uh, faced by all countries. Uh, inevitably, the, uh, the, the document cannot say much about what is likely to be the new normal after the pandemic. Uh, in that regard, oh, I would like to make a comment as well. We at the Policy Center uh, last year, in mid-2020, we were deeply concerned with what we called uh, conditions of a perfect storm for emerging markets and developing economies. Namely, besides the difficulties, the inherently uh, difficulties to deal with the pandemic in the soil of, of these countries, we, uh, we saw the emerging markets and developed economies facing the triple shocks associated from not only the financial shock, uh, but also uh, tourism, uh, remittance, and commodity price. And uh, it's, it's interesting, it's remarkable how uh, at least two of those conditions for a perfect storm have been better than expected in the case of remittance and in the case of the commodity price at least from the standpoint of commodity exporters. Now, uh, I, I have a question that I would like to ask uh, Mauha particularly on the following. We, we don't know much yet about the new normal, but we know that some scars will leave consequence, uh, not only in the labor markets, uh, income distribution, uh, uh, higher public debt, higher private debt in some cases and so on. But one of those scars might be, uh, and certainly it will be a partial reversal 
of uh, globalization. To some extent, uh, as we also say at the Policy Center, the pandemic is not changing history, but it's speeding it up. And, and those challenges to globalization, to trade globalization, that we're already there, they may be intensified by as a consequence of the, 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 the pandemic. In that regard, I'd like to ask Malha if he could a bit say a bit more about what he means by referring to need to protect critical medical uh, supply chains. Uh, in the sense that, you know, this is a, a, a big question because it's understandable uh, that the countries uh, will try to boost, to diminish their dependency uh, from, in the case of medical supplies from abroad, uh, you know, and the, the vaccine nationalism has not helped in that regard. But the point is that to what extent this review of uh, what is critical uh, supply chains is to be taken. It comes to mind, for instance, the continuity uh, in uh, in the case of the U.S. government, President Biden uh, putting so much emphasis on Buy America, uh, uh, and I, it's also, it also comes to mind uh, an important speech made by President Macron last year, when he referred to the need to reveal the strategic uh, uh, sectors uh, in the eurozone and so on. So my my question is, what do you mean by protect critical supply chains? That's my my first. Second, uh, the, uh, uh, you guys say or think that these cars uh, will be smaller than the ones derived from the global financial crisis. Okay, uh, I understand this uh, uh, given the fact that financial crisis uh, typically leave a, a, a legacy that you know, uh, uh, hampers growth for, for a, a long time and so on. But we also should take into account that these cars derived from the pandemic are a bit different from a typical financial crisis. And some of them, when we think on the, the enduring impact on the labor market, on low skilled laborers, on, on the, the structural unemployment that might come, that shall come with digitalization and so on, I have some doubts about whether one could say that these cars will be smaller than the global financial crisis. It depends on which cars are, we are talking about. Third point, and related to this, uh, and also question, uh, I like very much the way the documents establish divergence in recoveries. Uh, it's too early to say if the, the, uh, the, that we will have a consequence in terms of changes in, in the potential growth rates of the countries which is uh, quite important because in some circles, people have uh, interpreted the, the pandemic as signaling a reversal of the trend of convergence that we were watching in the years prior to, do, to, uh, prior to the, the current crisis. So divergence of recoveries uh, does not mean that the potential GDP growth afterwards will have to be different. And, and this is quite important to highlight. Uh, Third, uh, fourth point is on the, the possibility of a new taper tantrum. The, uh, Mrs. Berkman brought it to the discussion and it appears quite clearly in the, in the region economic outlook, but there's not much about it in the world economic outlook. Uh, and and, and, and Moha, when he spoke, he kind of sounded like sharing the optimism of the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, at least when it comes to the ultimate impact of the big fiscal package approved by, by President Biden. Uh, whereas the markets are uh, seem to be a little bit more uh, pessimistic with respect to the inflation rate and the likelihood of early uh, end of the, the, uh, the, the loose financial conditions. So I wonder, whether, well, the same fiscal package, I imagine, I am pretty sure, uh, influenced in the uptick, in the upgrade of the, the forecast at the World Economic Outlook. And it makes all sense. The, the, the US economy is already uh, showing a, 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 a faster movement uh, of recovery and so on. 
but uh, my question is, uh, are you guys more aligned with the, the optimistic view uh, displayed in the last uh, funk minutes that inflation will not really go much beyond the 2% and so we can rely on the maintenance of the loose financial conditions. Is, is that something that we can read from the documents? And finally, in final point, uh, I saw recently, I can't remember if it was uh, a, a video, the, 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 the conference of launch of the World Economic Outlook where Ms. Georgieva was there with Jeremy Powell and in uh, and, and, and uh, other uh, President Ngozi as well. And at certain moment, uh, uh, Mrs. Gergieva uh, expressed some concerns with quantitative easing in emerging market, in some emerging market economies. Uh, I know this is more something for the Global Financial Stability Report, but I, I would ask you if you uh, could say a bit more because uh, are you concerned with the experiments of QE in emerging market economies? But thank you very much, not only for the work, uh, but also for the nice and clear presentations. Thank you. So Mr. Navar, go ahead. Or anyone from the IMF team can jump and answer to the Mr. Otaviano's questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Canuto. Very good questions. Um, let me just maybe briefly respond to them and then um, maybe my colleagues may want to chip in as well. Uh, in terms of the first, just to take them in the order that you raised them, in terms of the supply chains, the, the recommendation there was specifically on what we're seeing with regard to uh, vaccines and vaccine imports at this point. Uh, this concern that, that, that countries might be uh, resorting to some form of protectionism and what we worry about is that, that if that pattern were to intensify, that would only mean tit for tat retaliation. These, these as, as you well know, the, 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 these vaccines rely on inputs that are produced elsewhere. For example, the, the mRNA vaccine relies on lipids that are produced in some countries that are then transported for, for use in the manufacture in other countries. And, 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 and blocking access to either to the final product itself or to inputs will only mean um, provoking a, a similar response from the trading partners and that could be to the detriment of, of all of us so what's essential right now is to ensure that that everybody gets as unimpeded access to the vaccines as quickly as possible that's that's really the, the, the primary uh, goal at this point in terms of the the scars, you're absolutely right. It's a very good point you raised that the that what we're talking about here is just a comparison of output. And of course, uh, it's conditional on, um, as I said in my presentation, avoiding major systemic financial distress, ensuring that this pandemic is actually durably beaten back in the next year and a half. If those assumptions fail, if, if we see a departure from that, of course, uh, the medium term outlook would change and and then our view on scarring and how it compares with uh, the GFC episode would also change. But beyond that, I think you raise a very important point that there are different dimensions to scarring. There's the labor market dimension, the diminished labor force participation and people not being able to re-engage with the workforce. And we know that even in plain vanilla recessions, uh, there is this tendency to for for some jobs never to come back, and especially the, 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 the middle skill jobs that tend to get hollowed out because of uh, shifts to automated work processes and things. And in this case, we are seeing uh, arguably a, an acceleration towards the towards automate, the automate, automation and digitalization because of the pandemic condition. And, and so we worry that that could actually mean even more hollowing out of the middle skill jobs than would be typically associated with, um, with recessions. So we have to watch that very closely. And that's why a lot of attention is devoted in the reports to, to the labor market. We have a, a chapter in the WIO that looks at labor market recoveries and what needs to be done to, to hasten the employment recovery coming out of this recession, the, the mix between retention and reallocation policies. So we have um, we spent a lot of time talking about that and we will be following this very, very closely going forward. In terms of uh, the paper tantrum issue, um, again, you know, in my presentation, you're right, I did not go into great detail on this. We have a, another chapter in the WIO, a full analytical chapter that looks at uh, the spillovers to emerging market and developing economies from episodes of very fast increases in, in, in advanced economy interest rates. 
uh, the news there is as no surprise that if these increases uh, are accompanied by good news on on growth prospects uh, then that constellation need not necessarily pose any difficulties to to emerging market and developing economies however if the increases happen very rapidly because markets very rapidly shift their expectations about the pace at which they expect the, the, the Fed, for example, to normalize policy. And this isn't accompanied by significant improvements in the growth outlook, just the speed at which interest rates increase, but, but, but not accompanied by, by, by news on improved growth prospects could pose difficulties for certain vulnerable borrowers, particularly those that are highly leveraged, those, those that have borrowed heavily in foreign currency uh, and have limited trade links to the advanced economy. So it is, it is very much a worry that we have. At this point, we have seen some reversible outflows, but, but it's, it's still uh, not reached the point where we think that this is posing serious difficulties. Of course, there are some countries that are facing difficulties at this point, but it's not a, a broad widespread phenomenon like we saw, for example, in uh, 2013. Um, on the quantitative easing in emerging markets, um, our message has been that, that you know, countries that have adopted these unconventional, EMs that have adopted these unconventional policies, um, if they do it to, to address market dysfunction, to, to, to ensure, to avoid excessive volatility in interest rates, to provide liquidity, and they do it in a way that they communicate that this is very much consistent with their price stability mandates, then this need not pose any difficulties in terms of, of increases in risk premia and, and other worries that we might have about EMs embarking on this path. Um, so in, in instances where EMs feel that they need to deploy these unconventional measures, um, they need to do that. They need to communicate very clearly what the objective is, that it's temporary, that, that, it's, that, the, that the sovereign is accessing, is able to access central bank financing on market terms, that this is, this is very much consistent with price stability mandates. Um, all, of those, all of those steps will help avoid uh, this perception of fiscal dominance that, that the central bank is doing this to ensure that the sovereign has access to, to long-term funding at low rates um, and, and ensure that, that, the, that, the, um, that it does not provoke any financial market reaction. In fact, it, what we've seen over the last year when many EMs did embark upon this path, thanks, of course, to improvements in policy frameworks that they had they'd implemented over the past few years, uh, we did not see major reactions to, to these uh, these experiments, the departures from conventional policy responses. So in order to avoid any kind of trouble on that front, they need to continue, if they are going to deploy these measures, they need to continue adopting the approach they've adopted so far, which is extremely well communicated uh, to ensure that, that, that the market understands that this is consistent with their price stability mandates. But, but uh, perhaps my colleagues may want to add to that. If I may come uh, on the regional aspect, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, perfect. Um, I just want to touch base uh, on this current issue uh, and the potential growth, uh, Otaviana, you were mentioning. Um, the first thing is that you're absolutely right. At this stage, it is very difficult to differentiate what is a supply side shock, what is a demand side shock, and what is the impact on the potential GDP. Um, the second thing that I would like to emphasize is that the longer it's going to take for countries to recover, uh, it's gonna, the scarring will be larger. And we're talking about that uh, lost skills in terms of the labor markets, uh, people dropping out of labor uh, markets, people forgetting their skills. Um, uh, we were talking about companies are not investing uh, sufficiently. So the longer uh, risk, like the, the longer recovery uh, period will translate into larger scarring in the future. Now with that, I would like to emphasize that there is a risk. We do see a risk for our region that the scarring or the output losses might be larger than the global financial crisis uh, for the region within the subset. And this, uh, I will qualify in two things. I mean, uh, Talene in her uh, opening remarks mentioned that high unemployment rates for certain countries, they were already high. And uh, particularly the youth uh, in the region has been also affected and the youth unemployment is quite high in certain countries. Now, if that is unaddressed, uh, that might actually cause into severe labor market issues. Secondly, uh, whether uh, the, uh, the region will uh, transform itself from this traditional, uh, let's say, growth sectors to new emergent sectors, it is a question of the policy as well. So it is not 
and like say given thing. And I would like to hear uh, to highlight the uh, the opportunities uh, to use this crisis to um, uh, like to build back, not to build back, but build forward uh, better. I mean, if you look at our uh, the title of our uh, report, we didn't say build back to the pre-COVID reality. We are trying to use that build forward. And with that, I would like to emphasize that there is a room for the policymakers. It's easier said than done. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, like monitoring of how the economies are changing, a lot of dialogue with, with the different segments of the society. But um, we see opportunities to reduce the scarring, but if anything, increase the potential growth that we have been seeing in the future, uh, like in the past. And we highlighted in the last, for example, slide, I just passed very quickly, uh, but Talin also mentioned that um, first, uh, the, uh, the region can use uh, the crisis as an opportunity to rethink about these long-standing issues, whether use this momentum and just uh, go with the reforms. Secondly, we highlighted also the, uh, the, the trends that are accelerating uh, with the region. For example, uh, on the digitalization and technology, if it is managed carefully, how can the region use this to improve productivity? How can it be done in a way that that's created in a uh, way that the, uh, as Malhar was mentioning, that creates job opportunities, but good job opportunities how the education system should be tailored such that the youth and the labor market are skilled towards these new emerging sectors. So there is a comprehensive way of thinking. And now we think that it's a time to think about those things. And finally, uh, going forward, uh, the thinking about how the region will adapt to climate uh, change and how it can use uh, those to uh, A, to diversify the economies, be adapt to climate change and see use these opportunities and investments to create better jobs. So uh, we do see risks uh, in terms of scarring could be larger than the global uh, financial crisis, but depending on the policies, we do see opportunities to uh, to address those challenges. that we can that they can send us their questions via YouTube Facebook and Twitter and I'll be very glad to forward them to our experts <coughs> at the end of the webinar but now let's hear Mr. Roberto Cardelli sharing his insights on the Moroccan economy growth outlook and downturn challenges ahead of us especially this eternal dilemma between setting the stage for a swift recovery and the fiscal consolidation so Mr. Robert, the Roberto the floor is yours yes Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Abdullah. Let me just uh, share my screen this time. Um, e yeah, we are. Oop. We'll try again. Ah, uh, and again. Okay, so my uh, uh, the next few minutes I'm going to try and 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 put what Malar, Talin, and Pelin have, and Ottaviano as well, their points that they made on uh, on the global economy around the region. I'm going to kind of fit them into our narrative for uh, for Morocco. Uh, of course, the usual disclaimer, this uh, narrative is constantly changing, is uh, constantly subject to the data scrutiny. And uh, as we, um, given the uncertainty that has been mentioned many times in, uh, in the intervention before, uh, we, of course, need to um, be able to change our narrative as soon as we see the data pointing to different, uh, to different directions. The first, uh, the first message that I want to uh, emphasize with this with this slide is that we have seen uh, a beginning of the recovery in Morocco and as as Malar said there's an important component of this recovery which is the trade manufacturing uh, link um, the trade if you look at the export and imports uh, have uh, have rebounded from their their trough uh, in April exports more uh, more gradually imports 
a little bit more slowly, but more decisively uh, in 2021, the first two months uh, of this year. And this has been a pretty across the board a strong rebound, not only of consumer goods, but also intermediate uh, goods and, and machinery and equipment. And, and, and industry, manufacturing is playing a, 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 a role in the recovery. If you look at the chart on the right side, which is the employment, it, it can show that in the last quarter, industry, which is manufacturing, which is the red bar, added about, in the last quarter of 2020, about 80,000 jobs. Um, meaning that it is undergoing uh, a recovery from the hit that it received in uh, in uh, in uh, in the second and third quarter of of last year together with the rebound in the agricultural sector because of the uh, of the better second harvest this is uh, uh, driving the, uh, the 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 beginning of the recovery in uh, in morocco so it's good signals uh, that allow some optimism going forward now, there's the, 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 the other engine of growth, uh, which is very important uh, for Morocco, which is the service, in particular the tourism-related uh, engine of growth, which is very much dependent on the process on the vaccination uh, side, as, uh, as uh, Malar uh, and Pelin have emphasized. Now, Morocco uh, is doing pretty well, I have to say, in, uh, on, the, on the vaccine. has been, uh, you know, uh, one of the best, if, not the best certainly country in in, uh, in the region uh, but also globally uh, the performance in the first uh, two months of the vaccination which has been uh, uh, february march has been nothing short of spectacular this chart on the left uh, uh, here shows that morocco has been very active in in, in buying and purchasing a, a vaccine and in uh, 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 give, bringing these vaccines to to the population of course as we all know in april the pace of vaccination has slowed because of, of supply constraints, and there is a, an increase in the, in, the, in the number of cases. So uh, clearly there's some uncertainty on how fast uh, this process is going to lead to herd uh, immunity in Morocco. But, but I'll say that right now the, 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 the biggest uh, uh, constraint is supply, but in terms of logistics, Morocco has, has shown to be able to, to do this pretty quickly so as, as you know, once the the the, the supply uh, and the uh, concerns are addressed, I think one should expect this process to continue at fast rates. I mean, in our narrative, I'll say more than projections, we think that in the last quarter of this year, Morocco is going to be um, essentially able to um, uh, to reach herd immunity, let's say, um, and and to uh, uh, you know reach very good advances in this vaccination process. Of course. For Morocco in the tourism sector, it's important not only the vaccination process in Morocco is as important, if not even more important, the vaccination process in in in, in other parts of the of of the globe and in particular its trading partners uh, in Europe, in particular. Uh, so we'll need to see good advances uh, uh, there. And there is, if if one look at the mobility index uh, from Google, there is this ten between ten and twenty percent of slack in mobility, uh, which is kind of the, uh, the, the, the proxy that links uh, the vaccination and the, and the lockdown measures to economic activity, there's still a 10, 10, between 10 and 20 percent gap relative to the pre-crisis that needs to be, to be filled. Uh, once we see that gap filled, then is presumably when we're going to see this engine of growth related to service and tourism to add to the manufacturing and, and trade and, and, and accelerate the recovery uh, from last year recession, together, as I said, with the with the good performance of the agricultural sector, which is very important, of course, for Morocco. Still, our our narrative right now is that the recovery is going to be slow. I mean, of course, what does slow means? I mean, if one look at the at the chart on on the left hand side, we're going to see the the, the rebound um, a little bit short of the the average for uh, for May, not better than uh, if compared to neighboring countries like Tunisia and Algeria. But it's especially one look at the, at the chart on the right that one can appreciate the, uh, the, the incomplete, let's say, nature of the recovery. With this slide, is, it's the equivalent for Morocco, the slide that Pelin showed before for MENA countries in particular. And this showed that relative to pre-crisis trends, uh, you know, Morocco is going to lose uh, uh, quite a lot of activity. Uh, in uh, in the next uh, in the next five years, um, this is on the high side, 
is compared to other economies. And, and the reason is that Morocco is being a tourism uh, intensive uh, economy uh, is, uh, is expected to, uh, to be affected by more than, uh, than the countries in, uh, in, uh, in the region. It's in the, let's say, upper uh, quartile of the distribution in terms of uh, uh, our global uh, projection. So that's not only the tourism story, but there's also other reasons why we think the recovery is going to be slow. Let me just focus on a couple of them. The first one, the first reason why we expect the recovery to be relatively slow is has to do with the with this balance sheet type of scarring from uh, from the uh, from the pandemic uh, and the drought uh, last year. A balance sheet from a public and private perspective, but in this case, let's start with the public perspective, the increase in public sector debt uh, and gross financing needs. Um, as the chart on the on the left show, gross financing need are going to be higher than than before, uh, around 15% going of GDP going down gradually as the fiscal consolidation uh, continues. We don't expect this to be a major uh, issue. We do we don't think that there's going to be any debt sustainability. This is in our baseline, of course. There's always risks around uh, our uh, uh, projections but we don't emphasize in the article 4 report we published in january we didn't emphasize the liquidity and sustainability issues but it is at the same time true that having the domestic financial institution banks in particular having to fund a higher share of the uh, of the treasury financing needs then it means that maybe there is less credit available um, for the rest of the economy, particularly for the private sector. And, and, and another reason why credit may be impaired, credit creation may be impaired going forward, is that banks have seen a decent increase in their non-performing loans. They're not being affected, I'll say, um, too much. Or so far, we haven't seen, uh, let's say, the full extent of, of the impact. But what we have seen is, is, is manageable. Uh, we're probably going to know more about the impact of the crisis on banks' balance sheets and banks' uh, uh, loans as we go forward in, in, in this year. But certainly, if we have one look at the increase in non-performing loans in the right uh, chart, you know, there's some reason to be cautious in terms of the ability of banks to be able to create credit. Uh, and and we, we see a little bit of this in the in the credit uh, uh, dynamics uh, in uh, in the last few uh months the chart in on the left show that as far as credit to non-financial firms is concerned the one that's been funded by uh, the uh, uh the amount the amount of oxygen the, the credit subsidized uh, uh, um, the government credit subsidized schemes which is mainly working capital to support working capital has been growing uh, at robust rate but the credit to to fund uh, uh, investment in machinery and equipment has been coming down it has been on the negative side recently. Credit uh, to households for, for consumption has always been negative in the last few months. I, I, interestingly, credit to for mortgages, for the purchase of, of real estate has actually been uh, holding uh, up uh, better, uh, despite the rapid increase in non-performing loans in, uh, in, uh, in household mortgages. That's, a, that's an interesting, very interesting point. And the chart on the right, show what I, I think is this risk of, of crowding out. Uh, so the fact that uh, the treasury financing needs are higher because of the higher deficit doesn't create a lot of nervousness in, 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 in here, at least in our, uh, in our team at the IMF in terms of capacity of treasury to fund those needs given the large domestic institutional base and, and, and the large amount of saving domestic saving that can be tapped um, in, uh, in, uh, in Morocco. But, you know, the, 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 the other side of the coin may be uh, less credit available for the private sector. And that chart over there shows that this uh, uh, kind of crowding out has been kind of a trend, if you want, uh, feature in, in, uh, in Morocco as debt move, uh, moved higher. Um, banks have been increasingly giving credit to treasury and uh, uh, less so to non-financial firms. So we think that that dynamic may be um, kind of a, a, a impacting the, uh, the, the the pace of the recovery. And the other scarring is, of course, the, the scarring, the structural scarring, the scarring that, that Malar uh, 
Pelin or Tahian or Talin have, have already mentioned, uh, the factors that affect potential potential growth. Uh, and, and, and of course, we don't know the severity of these factors, but we all know that qualitatively, um, you know, there's reasons to believe that potential is going to be affected by negatively by, by the pandemic. The chart on the left is the same chart that, uh, that Malar showed on the on the day of education lost in 2020 it would have been nice to add to add morocco but we didn't have the data uh, at the same time morocco may be you know somewhere around those bars uh, and as we know morocco already and i'll show a chart the last chart the last slide in in a few seconds starts from um let's say uh, less than desirable uh, uh you know results in terms of outcomes in terms of education uh, uh, quality so there is a risk that it, it, the pandemic may have an effect there and the labor market story it's true as we showed in the first i showed in the first uh, slide there is employment has rebounded in uh, in uh, in uh, q4 including in industry uh but there's a there's a lot of uh, slack in the in the labor market it's it's here it's an employment it's a labor force participation it's not the same across uh, uh, gender it's not the same across uh, parts of the country in terms of rural, rural versus urban. There's a lot of differentiation. So the aggregate uh, chart maybe doesn't pay full justice to the complexity uh, of the of the situation in Morocco. But clearly, the fact that there's a lot of slack in labor market indicators, in particular for women, in particularly for young, particularly for uh, for uh, 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 rural parts of the countries, you know, the longer that slack uh, uh, takes to be reabsorbed the higher is the possibility that that's going to eat into uh, potential uh, growth in the country. And, and the final, the, the natural conclusion of that is that in order to accelerate the pace of the recovery and in order to mitigate the scars, the long-term scars, as my colleagues have said in the past, really uh, structural reforms are indispensable. And I'll say that Morocco uh, has completely kind of received the, uh, the, 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 the message and accepted the, uh, the, the narrative in announcing some very important reforms uh, at the end of last year. One reform, which is the educational reform, has been there already. I mean, it's been launched a few years ago. But the reform of the social protection system and of the state or enterprise is a very important component uh, of, the, of the recovery. The charts here, the first chart shows that Morocco has uh, still a few uh, areas, as we know, where in terms of uh, of access to healthcare, where it's lagging behind, it's lagging behind the MENA uh, oil exporter countries, the other emerging markets, the OECD, in terms of hospital beds per thousand of people, uh, nurses and midwives per thousand of people, fishes per <laughs> thousand of people. That there are areas, of course, in addition to the fact that a lot of uh, uh, non-significant uh, a significant and non-negligible part of the population doesn't have any access to to healthcare. Uh, clearly, it shows that there are there are there are uh, areas where investing in healthcare is essential. It's essential not only from a social perspective, from you know, from 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 an equity perspective, but also from a human capital accumulation perspective. You cannot think about a country that can increase its human capital if it doesn't provide uh, health care which is which are uh, uh, um, uh, you know of a certain nature education same story there are there are uh, good good results in terms of net enrollment at the primary level but morocco has still uh, uh, some issues with the with the secondary with the quality of education in terms of pica uh, results the education reform which has been which is ongoing which is which is you know complicated it's it's uh, it's uh, it's it goes in the right direction, but as as Karim said at the beginning, we're talking about reforms that may have effect over generations, uh, one generation if we're lucky. So it's it's very it's very you know important at the same time it's very difficult uh, to to assess the impact, but it's very important to continue and to be able to to assess the impact of those reforms uh, as they go. And the third chart shows the it's it's about the reforms of the SOEs. I mean the, the, the emphasis on the reform on, on, on state owned enterprises in Morocco has been so far, as far as far as I'm concerned, I may be wrong, about the need to improve the governance. The uh, it's an efficiency story, no, to improve the efficiency 
of SOEs to make them more profitable, uh, to make sure that they're going to operate in the sectors where they're actually needed, uh, so that they actually even represent less of a burden on, on the fiscal. So improve the efficiency, rationalize, improve the governance. But it, there's also another dimension, which I think is going to be as important, which is to take the opportunity of that reform to improve uh, the chances for the private sector uh, to grow and to develop uh, and to create jobs. I mean, this chart here shows that the, uh, the SMEs, the small and medium enterprises contribution to employment in Morocco is, is small. I mean, these are dated data. I mean, these are data from 2012, but frankly, there's no reason uh, to think that the situation has changed a lot. The gap is, is pretty large in terms of uh, comparison with emerging markets and, uh, and advanced economies. So the challenge there is not only, of course, to increase the efficiency and the governance uh, of SOEs, but also to improve on market neutrality, leveling the playing field, uh, remove the distortions that prevent uh, uh, a private sector to develop, small firms to develop, because we know there's plenty of evidence there that a lot of good jobs and a lot of jobs period are coming uh, from uh, from that channel. And that channel, uh, there's, 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 way, there's room to go in Morocco to strengthen the channel. And that's it. This is the last slide. And in perspective, the different structural reforms that will support the Moroccan economy, not only to overcome the crisis, but to lay the ground for a more robust economic uh, growth in the long run. And as you stress it, I believe that the biggest challenge for the Moroccan economy is to avoid a further loss of momentum in the long term growth. Because in the last global financial crisis, we thought that the that the crisis would not concern the Moroccan economy, but we ended it ended inflicting damage to the supply capacity of the country three to four years after by cutting potential growth to around three percent instead of 4.5. It was related to much more structural factors, but the crisis made the speed up actually the 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 process. So so now let's turn to our audience and the first question is about the vaccine rollout. So our participant is, is, a, is asking what can be done to increase the accessibility from also an IMF perspective and if we should engage in a halt on the system of protection of intellectual property, as many world, world leaders have, have suggested. So anyone of, 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 you, of you can, can, can jump and and share his insights on on the topic. Pauline, do you want to, or do you, should you want me to? It's... Uh, maybe you can start with course. the global and I can do the regional aspect. Right. Okay. So I mean, this is uh, perhaps the most important uh, issue on our on our minds, on, on everyone's minds at this moment. Uh, without, without adequate access, global access to vaccines, so, it's going to be very difficult to beat back this pandemic and to resolve, resume normalcy in um, contact intensive activity, tourism, cross-border services. Um, so our sense is that, that, that essentially there has to be better coordination on production and distribution. And part of this relates to ensuring that the COVAX facility is fully funded. Um, many, as, as I mentioned in my presentation and Pauline did too, uh, many countries in, around the world and, and also in the MENA region uh, rely heavily on COVAX uh, for procuring the vaccines, this collective uh, procurement vehicle. And, and it's vitally important to ensure that it's adequately funded to, 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 to uh, ensure equitable access to vaccines. Um, we also see that there's uh, some countries have been able to procure a large number of doses, perhaps even more doses than will be required at least in the first round to inoculate their populations. And so we need a mechanism to be able to redistribute excess doses from countries that have the surplus or have been able to secure surplus uh, to those that are in need of, of, of the vaccines. And then just to echo again the point that I raised in the question, that, uh, in response to the question that uh, Ottaviano posed about uh, uh, protectionism. And this is a very worrisome um, factor and we have to ensure that, that we avoid restrictions of any kinds on vaccine exports uh, 
on on the export of vaccine inputs uh, because if if you start going down that path it very quickly could could disintegrate into a, into a tit for tat retaliation uh, leaving everyone worse off in this situation Maybe just to add what Malhar said, uh, maybe I'll emphasize four points. Uh, the first part is, uh, as I was uh, showing in my presentation, uh, we have some regional, like global leaders in our region. Now, the first part is to share in this excess like production. Uh, and that would require regional collaboration, how you go about it. So that's why we had been emphasizing the uh, regional cooperation to ensure that at least within the region, apart from the supply side uh, constraints globally, to ensure that anyone who has an extra like uh, can distribute now the second thing is that it's not only an issue of supply side but also many countries in the region lack the logistical know-how on how to do and organize and they would need cooperation and help uh, not only the ex uh, like having the vaccines but also the logistical challenges to deal with depending on which vaccine you would get um the third part is uh, the the having the sufficient financing available for those, uh, including through the COVAX facility, but uh, making sure that uh, countries would need, at least if there is a BOP need that's generated for this one, countries have the financing. And the final point that I would like to emphasize, and that's more for countries that are going to, not through the COVAX facility, but having contractual agreements. What we have seen in the region that a lot of these contracts are not transparent. Uh, meaning that we don't know what the terms, what the uh, pricing, having a transparency around those contracts would help other countries to see which country is getting at what cost to make sure that they're actually getting these vaccines at a reasonable and like uh, price that would improve the uh, vaccine access. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you so much. So another participant actually is, 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 is asking about this this divergent paths of recovery. And he's wondering if there is any talks about the allocation of SDRs between rich and poor countries within the IMF in order to, to mitigate this, this divergence and, uh, and why not finance the needed structural reforms? So uh, maybe I'll just jump in on that. At this point, I mean, we'd say, there, are, there is serious consideration being given to various options related to how to efficiently use the SDRs, including uh, the redistribution recycling that you that you just mentioned. Uh, at this point, it's it's still early to speculate on what forms those mechanisms will take. Uh, but rest assured that a lot of thought is being given to precisely that question at this point. Thanks. So. I think our last question goes to Mrs. Belkman on the timing of the reform you just talked about on for the region, because there are some structural reforms actually that is quite hard to implement, especially in this time of the crisis. So how about a kind of sequencing of, of, of these reforms in order to have the, 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 the impact that we need actually in this in, this, in light of the crisis? That is a very good question, uh, particularly um, the uh, I highlighted the issues and they are quite wide ranging. We're talking about governance, we're talking about labor market, we're talking about state owned enterprises. And some of those, as you highlighted, is going to be difficult uh, by definition, even through difficult times. Now, what we wanted to emphasize is that um, there are two types of reforms that uh, countries can take action on. The first one is uh, that we uh, uh, were talking about, there are low hanging fruits in terms of making sure that uh, the recovery is accelerated. Now, uh, two aspects that I could mention, for example, uh, that uh, what we've seen in the last time, uh, like in 2020, that a lot of countries managed to use digitalization and technology uh, to uh, deliver, for example, social safety nets more efficiently. And this has been what we have been talking. So there was some leapfrogging on those aspects. So using these accelerating trends uh, is a low hanging fruit for the region. So uh, we had been highlighting, therefore, investment through uh, faith, uh, using the experiences by other countries, how these technologies and digitalization were used to deliver more efficient social safety nets. So that's one. Uh, 
The second part is um, there is also a need, uh, we highlighted in our uh, presentations, that uh, policies to ensure resource allocation. And part of it is related to uh, the education and the training of the labor force, where we see a lot of risk. Um, now is the time for rethinking about uh, the rehiring policies. Now is the time for rethinking about how do we train, uh, let's say, all like the 50 percent unemployed youth to make ready uh, for the new jobs. So those kind of policies uh, that would ensure that at least uh, that uh, recovery will take hold and then uh, will accelerate it, will bridge the gap between that as the recovery goes on, then the uh, planning can take place. And the third aspect that I would highlight is that um, it's uh, last year, a lot of countries were thinking about they were in the crisis mode. Uh, so they were managing the crisis. And this year uh, we are highlighting there not only to, to do that, but they have to start the discussion around uh, what, uh, what can be done. So starting an early con conversation in terms of what policies are like, and this will be country specific, in each uh, country, what policies can be done uh, what, uh, at this current juncture, and what policies we have the resources to implement uh, for this time. Having an early discussion and the planning uh, going forward can start right now, and that would help also with the sequencing, uh, tailoring the sequencing for each country's specific situation. Thank you so much for your responses. I think if our panelists don't have any further comments, uh, fortunately, we're running out of time. So I will take a minute to thank you all, Mr. Malhar Nabar, Mrs. Belen Berkman, Mr. Ottaviano Canuto, Mr. Roberto Cardelli, and of course, Mrs. Tallinn Corinchelian, the deputy director, and our president, Mr. Alainawi. So thank you so much and hope we can have another occasion to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.